25 years ago now, I set out on that journey to Worms, sure that that would be my last day. For, as I declared, if the Emperor was inviting me in order for me to recant, then I would never go. But if he was inviting me to my death, then I would gladly come. On April the 2nd, 1521, Luther set out from Wittenberg on the two-week journey to Wurms. In front rode his escort, Charles V's imperial herald, a guarantee of safe conduct. Luther's friends had done all they could to dissuade him from going, convinced he would never return alive. But as he traveled across Germany, Luther now began to glimpse the vast popularity of his cause and works. In Erfurt, the city elders threw a huge party for the passing traveler. In Frankfurt, he was showered with gifts by the city's publishers. He was, after all, one of Europe's most successful authors. The awareness of his popularity might have given him some courage as he proceeded on to Worms, but I do not see in Luther the kind of big head that celebrities often get today. He was more devoted to that principle. He's still a single-minded idealist. I think as Luther approaches Worms, he finds himself torn between two emotions. He is genuinely frightened. What is going to happen? Am I going to be safe? And on the other hand, he's realizing that people like him, that he started something that seems to be snowballing. On the morning of the 16th of April, Luther finally approached the city of Worms. The memory would burn in him until his dying days. On that day, I was greeted by a multitude. The whole city thronged the streets. An escort of knights saw me through the city gates. The priest ran towards me, touched me, as if I was a saint. When Luther arrived, the crowds came out to gawk and cheer, and one of the papal representatives reported back to Rome that nine out of ten people were yelling, long live Luther, and lest the pope take any satisfaction, the tenth was yelling, death to the pope. To his last day and beyond, Luther's appearance before the Diet would stand as the pinnacle of his life. The day was hot, but the sun had sunk into a red glow. In that one room were gathered the greatest powers of Europe, the princes of Germany, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles and the Papal Nuncio, Johannes Meyer von Eck. 
These were the men in whom God now entrusted my life. The only person in the room that Luther knew was his own prince, Frederick the Wise. But he knew that it was the votes of everyone here that would decide his fate. The Pope's ambassador had only one demand, that Luther recant every one of his writings. But Luther would remain true to his principles and to his words. We must realize how very frightening this must have been for Luther. Arrayed against him are the forces of church and the forces of the state. And it's clear that they are placing him under huge pressure simply to stand back, to say, no, I shouldn't have done this, I shouldn't have said that. He was shown a pile of his books and asked if they were all his. Indeed, all the books are mine, and I've written more if you want to read them. He would refuse to recant in terms both clear and simple. I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have all contradicted each other. My conscience is captive only to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything. For to go against my conscience is neither right nor safe. Legend tells us that Luther closed his address with one of history's greatest declarations of exhausted defiance. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. Luther's statement really marks the dawn of a new era, the era of the ordinary person standing up against authority and saying, I'm sorry, this is what I believe. My conscience tells me this. I cannot do anything else. That, I think, is a defining moment in the emergence of our modern understanding of personal and institutional freedom. This moment in Worms is very powerful. It's a time when a man stood up and spoke the truth and spoke for the truth and spoke for liberty of conscience. And we see him therefore as a monument to liberty of conscience. It's one of these grand gestures where an individual stands for something much larger than himself. Luther had been allowed to return to his lodgings after the hearing. He was told he would receive the verdict on the following day. He was sure that he would be handed over to the agents of Rome to face inquisition and trial for heresy. But then, he received an extraordinary message. The judges had been unable to come to the unanimous verdict that the rules of the deed required. One of those abstaining was Luther's old protector, Frederick the Wise. He has perceived the usefulness of Martin Luther. He doesn't want him to die. He wants to go on using him as a kind of weapon against the papacy and the church. And I think he's also very attracted to Luther's teachings, and he genuinely wants Luther to continue his work.
Luther was granted safe passage back to Wittenberg from Worms. But the threat of arrest by the powers of the church still hung over him. Frederick now took drastic action. He had Luther snatched on his way back from Worms and hidden away in a remote and isolated castle called the Wartburg, where the agents of the Pope would never find him. <laughs> 